yeah, you don't have to transmit anything like you would with radar pulses. You don't have to be above the water like you would be to detect uh, GPS. Um, and so you can safely navigate great distances in theory if you've got a brilliant inertial navigation system on, say, mm. a submarine. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson, particle physicist here again. I hope you've had a brilliant week and have a fantastic weekend in store. Now, quantum navigation may be the future for militaries worldwide. And Britain's latest system aboard the test ship HMS Patrick Blackett just completed a South Coast pleasure cruise. Quantum navigation systems exploit the quantum properties of atoms to measure an object's movement more precisely than by conventional means. A ship equipped with the technology could potentially navigate more accurately than with chart and compass, and also navigate without satellite-based navigation, GPS, on which the world now relies. Quantum navigation could help ships and submarines to navigate the globe more accurately than ever before. So to help me dig into quantum navigation, how these systems work and the road ahead, I'm joined by a fantastic special guest, Dr. Ramsey Faraha. Ramsey is an expert in electronics, navigation and sensor fusion. He is a by fellow of Queen's College, Cambridge and the CTO, president and director of Focal Point Positioning Limited. He is a real life James Bond Q, according to Top Gear magazine. So who better to help me dig into the fascinating world of quantum navigation? Ramsey, how are you doing? Good, thank you, Sam. What's new in your life? Uh, just busy, 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 the usual sort of stuff. Um, uh, yes, uh, my, my navigation expertise will certainly um, help with today's little news story. So right up my street, this stuff. It is exactly right. That's why we got you back. So Ramsey is a fellow of the uh, Royal Institute of Navigation. That's right, isn't it? Yep. And the real life James Bond Q, according to Top Gear magazine. Now, I don't know which one of those is more prestigious. Ramsey, maybe you can make a call on that. <laughs> but both of them, I think, are going to uh, are going to help us out a little bit here. So we've heard uh, in the news today that we've got this essentially quantum navigation system. So what are we talking about here? What is a quantum navigation system? It sounds very kind of niche, very woo, very Deepak Chopra, you know, sticking <laughs> quantum on the front of something. What What's going on here? Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of our um, existing navigation systems use lasers and photons <laughs> and various bits and pieces of things that are already quantum. But what they're referring to here is um, anything that's using entanglement or superposition um, that they're labeling as being a, a quantum technology. And what this, uh, I was going to say little box, but it's definitely not a little box. What this thing uh, is, is a cold atom interferometer. So they cool down a cloud of rubidium atoms using lasers to a tiny, tiny fraction of a degree above absolute zero. And at that temperature, these uh, the cloud of atoms forms what's called a Bose-Einstein condensate which is the fifth state of matter, I believe. Is that right, Sam? Um, it's, it's, always, it's always a bit of a sore point as to how many states there are, but yes, we'll go, we'll go with that. And they're all sitting in this ground state anyway. So they're, they're extremely, extremely cold, very, very close to absolute zero. And they're all essentially sitting in the, in the ground state of the system in this, in this so-called Bose-Einstein condensate. Yeah, and the wacky thing that then happens when they're this cold and they're in this condition here is they start to behave more like waves than particles. So you've got wave-particle duality going on here, and that means that we can pretend that this thing is a laser with an incredibly small wavelength, and we can um, build interferometry systems which use the interference of light normally to make incredibly fine-scale measurements of movement but we can do it with a wavelength that's around 10,000 times finer than you can do with a laser. So this thing should be way more precise at measuring rotations and accelerations than any laser-based system that we have today. So it's, so it's kind of tricky to, to kind of work out what's going on. I need to have a look at a little bit more at the papers um, themselves. But, but as you said, we're cooling down this cloud of rubidium atoms to very close to absolute zero. The atoms start to behave basically like one big atom or a wave. They get these wave-like properties. 
we hit them with a laser we can we can make those those atoms or states of the system move on two different paths and then when those states reinteract we can look at that interference pattern that's created and that gives us some information about potentially the accelerations that were applied to that system while while the uh, while the states were going on their two different trajectories and very very fine measurements of the accelerations and forces that were applied to the system is that is that fair yeah and you're still <clears throat> you're still doing some aspects of um <clears throat> there are still some aspects of this that uh, feel like you're just lobbing particles around so they literally <laughs> trap them with lasers and then launch this cloud of atoms um on a trajectory so typically just up and down in a tube and uh basically when they recombine some of the atoms that went up and down in the tube with some that didn't they can put them through a process where there's an interference mm. pattern that emerges as if they were waves and it's that interference pattern that can be used to make incredibly fine scale um measurements and so yeah it's literally wave particle duality even even talking about <laughs> but, you know both things at the same time with this sort of, of setup. Um, so yeah, it's difficult to get your head around. Um, and that's probably why we don't build many systems. <laughs> like this. So, so that raises the, the next question naturally of why do we need the system? It sounds very complicated. Um, we, we've got solutions for, for navigation already. What are the advantages of, of, of this kind of system over a traditional system, say GNSS, GPS, or, or radar or other other navigation systems. Why are we going all out for these quantum systems? So these um, particular cold atom interferometers are a type of inertial navigation system. Right. So they just measure accelerations and rotations, and you can integrate up your acceleration to estimate your velocity, and then integrate it again to measure a position. And so, if you had perfect knowledge of where you started, and in theory a perfect inertial measurement system, you could just keep measuring accelerations and rotations and always track a line as to where you'd gone. So if and you know where you started and you know the forces you've been subjected to over time, you can work out exactly where you are if you had a perfect measurement of those forces that have been applied to you. Yeah, and it's called dead reckoning, and it's one of the oldest um, technologies so, uh, for trying to navigate. So this whole concept of, of knots as a measure of speed on ships was because they would put a piece of wood with a rope and some knots tied in it off the boat and they'd count how many knots went through their hand um, in a certain amount of time and that no. was the speed they were going in knots wow and if you knew your heading and your speed in knots you would calculate how far you'd traveled mm. after a certain amount of time so inertial um uh navigation has been the cornerstone of naval um, navigation for a very long time but the stuff you mentioned, radars, GNSS, et cetera, they're trying to give you the absolute position fixes. So GPS literally lets you calculate where you are, latitude, longitude, and altitude um, by using the measurements from the satellites. Radar-based navigation is often, I have a map of the environment around me. I will do a radar scan and I will match the sort of terrain and the mountainous bits and the valley bit on my radar map to my actual map. And when, that, when I've lined them up, I'm there. And so you can do absolute positioning with those technologies as well. But inertial navigation means that if you can't see things and you can't access the GPS signals, like, for example, you're a submarine underwater. Uh, OK, so it's completely insular. I don't need I don't need these these kind of third party signals to tell me where I am. I've got everything essentially in a box where I am giving me yeah, my, so my position. Yeah, you don't have to transmit anything like you would with radar pulses. You don't have to be above the water like you would be to detect uh, GPS. Um, and so you can safely navigate great distances, in theory, if you've got a brilliant inertial navigation system on, say, mm. submarine. But all platforms use inertial navigation to some degree um, to bridge gaps in things like GPS outages. So, um, you know, if you drive through a tunnel in your car, um, right now, today, uh, the accelerometers and gyros in your phone will try to continue to estimate how far you've gone down the tunnel, even though you don't have um, GPS available. So uh, we all combine inertial navigation with radio technologies in all of the systems that we use 
It's just that there's a difference between a one dollar G- <laughs> uh, one dollar accelerometer in a smartphone and a ten million dollar inertial navigation system on a sub using cold atoms. So I think I think here we've got an example of. Uh, Maybe a maybe an older, rougher example of what what happens on a submarine. So the submarine obviously doesn't have access to um, you know the GPS signal that's underwater. So what what's going on with this inertial navigation system here? What sort of things are we are we seeing? I might have got one that's so old that you that you don't know, but no, I, I suspect I'm purely guessing. Um, but that looks the thing on the right looks. There's a, like, there's a more modern one here if you want to uh, go on that one that, as well. That's a laser ring. All right, well we'll come to that in a second. So that, let's deal that, with this that one. That thing, that thing on the right is probably an old, really old-fashioned gimbaled hmm. flywheel gyro. So you spin up a flywheel really, really fast, and it's a gyroscope like you played with in school, like you know, big spinning bicycle wheel. And um, when you set it spinning, it will try to always maintain exactly the same orientation in space as you uh, move through space. So that's a bunch of turntables. That means this gyro is like always pointing north, no matter how your submarine moves underwater, you could kind of always look in that window and you would be able to see from the spinning disc which way north was. It wasn't really all done by eye, as you might imagine, but that's the gist. <laughs> so big, big spinny disc gyro is probably what the, th- probably what the thing on the right is. Those bo- other boxes in there, oh, the they're boxes. Probably- they're probably um, radio and sonar and stuff. So they're probably stuff like transit and some really, really ancient GPS um, re- equipment for when they did pop up a periscope to get a fix from above. What is this? Did you like Wikipedia some ancient yeah, yeah, inertial, inertial, inertial navigation system. First entry right. on Google or something. I mean, yeah, that looks ancient, whatever that stuff was. Um, and then that that hot look, looking picture of a sun at the top right, that's mm. that's a laser ring gyro. So they really do look like that. So that's a, a triangle, a mirrored path, and um, a laser beam goes in both directions, looping around um, that set of mirrors, those three mirrors. And it's called the Sanyak effect, I think, that when you rotate that, um, because the speed of light is finite, um, when you're stationary, the two laser beams travel exactly the same distance around those rings mm-hmm. in opposition. But if you rotate it, one of the laser beams travels a bit further than the other. And then you get an interference effect and you see a phase shift and you measure an interference yeah. fringe move. And you very, very, very accurately measure exactly how much you rotated that um, hot looking triangle. So, um, so, the que- the- so that raises the question then, if we've got these systems like this, then why, why are we having to go out all out for these cold? Do, do these things build up error? Do they do they drift? What what's going on with exactly? So there's there's two big arguments put forward for the cold atom stuff. So one of them is the argument that every atom is identical. So all of these rubidium atoms in the cloud they're all completely identical. Um, whereas um, with the bigger traditional systems that are made up of huge lumps of of, of uh, lead or something in your gyroscope, or you know that lasering gyro would really be like this big. So it's a big macroscopic object with lots and lots of um, mechanical parts. Um, they're all different. And so um, they all have slightly different biases and errors and um, scale factors and all of these parameters that are different from one to the next to the next to the next. And you have to then build systems where all of those errors and biases and imperfections in every single one that rolls out the factory has to be calibrated and can evolve over time. But the argument is that the cold atom stuff won't have biases. Every single one will be identical and there'll be very, very much fewer problems to deal with in terms of all of the different perturbations that can occur. The other thing that's attractive about them is that this wave particle duality we've already discussed, the wavelength of the cold atoms is about 10,000 times finer than any of the laser based technologies. And so when you're doing stuff with interferometry and you're Mm. measuring phase differences, if you can measure phase differences now with a resolution that's 10,000 times finer, then you've got a phenomenal sensitivity to exactly what your rotation or your acceleration was. That's the theory behind um, why it should be better to use these other technologies. But as I'm sure we're going to get into today, 
those things I've just mentioned are not the limiting factors in reality. So unfortunately, <laughs> it won't be as good as everyone's hoping. And it's going to be very hard to miniaturize these systems and make them cheap and make them work at a high update rate. So, so we're going to so we're going to come on to that in a minute. But that, so I guess to, to to kind of wrap that bit up, the two big things that are playing for this and the reason that people might want it is you've got that much higher resolution. And if you have that much higher resolution, much smaller errors, much smaller drift over time. So if you've got something like a submarine, potentially stay underwater for, you know, weeks, months at a time without having to come up to, um, you know, ping a GPS satellite or something like that and get a refix on its position because it's only building up this drift much more slowly. So it has much more confidence in where it is for a longer time under the water. I guess that's that's one yeah. thing. And then the other thing, as you said, is everything's kind of self-contained. So you could use this on a submarine, for example, without having to to ping a GPS satellite, and it's uh, it's all it's all confined. Is is there a big problem in in warfare? I'm guessing it, it pretty obviously is a problem if they're if they're going to this uh, going to these efforts of not being able to use GPS systems. I guess with with subs, you don't want to be close to the surface anyway to to, to get those uh, to get those yes. pings. There's two big concerns. So for general defense, everything outside of submarines like aircraft and attacks on the battlefield and stuff, um, because the GPS signal is 20,000 kilometers away, the transmission, the satellite's 20,000 kilometers away, um, and it's like a 50 watt transmission, it's an incredibly weak signal. So it's very easy to jam and um, just transmit very loud noise that wipes out your ability to hear GPS. And this is happening right now in the Ukraine-Russia conflict. There's lots of jamming going on and spoofing, which is when people try to either rebroadcast the stuff from the sky even louder just to confuse receivers or to transmit fake data to, again, confuse and make a receiver believe it's wherever you're faking it to be. So there are concerns there for any above ground platform having to deal with GPS being either jammed or spoofed. Mm -hmm. And then if it is, freewheeling through all of that anyway with inertial navigation technologies but specifically on the submarine side so you so you've got that backup there if if the gps is down you can use this this inertial navigation in the in the short term or you know even longer term if you've got these more um these sensors that have lower drift yeah and submarines are probably the most important asset in um, mutually assured destruction because they're an ever mobile ever hidden source of your nuclear deterrent and so um, you want them to uh, go away and hide and move around and stay hidden and be very hard to find and stay away and stay hidden for as long as, as possible every time they go out to sea and today the limiting factor on a submarine being out at sea is the amount of food to feed its uh, uh crew so they can make oxygen and they can make drinking water all underwater from the uh nuclear power plant on board the submarine and electrolysis of seawater and, and desalination and and things like that so it all comes down to the food uh and popping up to get gps fixes because the current inertial navigation system technologies drift and the error grows and the uncertainty grows at a certain rate, which is not publicly known. Um, but periodically during the course of the month, trying to stay hidden at sea, at the moment, submarines do have to pop up every now and again, break the surface with their periscope, get a GPS fix and go down to reset their understanding of their location. And fundamentally, the closer you are to the surface, the more likely you are to get. Sea. And they just don't like doing it and they don't want to do it. And um, this is an approach to try to reduce the amount of times that submarines would have to come up to the surface. Makes sense. So, so if this is such a such a great system, potentially allowing your you know your deterrent subs to stay under the water for long, long periods, um, you know it's very much more accurate than the current um, the current systems that we have. Lower lower drifts or slower drifts. Why do we not have these systems already? What, what, are the, what are the issues that we have to overcome before we can start rolling out these, uh, these rubidium atoms everywhere? Yeah, the the technology is actually very old. The UK has 
um, just been investing in the last decade or so in a whole bunch of quantum technologies. We set up hubs across the country, one concentrating on quantum computing, one on sensing, and this comes in the sensing one, uh, one on communication, and I think there's one other. Um, so we've recently invested a lot of money in trying to generate new quantum-based technologies. But this particular approach, the Americans have been looking into this through DARPA programs and um, there's a company called AOSense over in the USA that um, have had a cold atom interferometer for navigate for, well, it's a single axis accelerometer, so for sensing rather than navigation um, for well over a decade by now. And there are many challenges. Um, th this is a very, as you can see from this picture, this is a very delicate and complicated laboratory experiment. Maybe, maybe I can maybe there. I can pop this out and we can get a little bit of a, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, complicated laser beams pointing in all sorts <laughs> of directions, doing all sorts of stuff. And, you know, you're cooling stuff down to a fraction of a Kelvin. It's not um, the sort of thing you'd necessarily expect to be doing on a rolling ship, I guess. No, and th these are where all of the problems come in. So hmm. you've got the sort of practicality of, you know, fundamentally, some methods are just ludicrously delicate and they're not easy to make incredibly robust. And they don't always continue working when you shake them. And, you know, anything that involves incredibly carefully, precisely aligned <laughs> optical um, and the idea that you're launching atoms in a tube. And if you were to do that with the tube, the atoms would all just smash against the side yeah. and the, the measurement would be gone. There's all of these issues of um, just because you can make it work static in a lab like that doesn't mean it'll continue to work when you're rolling around on the deck of a ship like that and i think they said in the in the in the article they've got they've got temperature stabilization here in the lab they've got pneumatic tables to dampen out the vibrations obviously on a ship you know i'm sure they can control the temperature but the the, the deck rolling around you're gonna have to uh you know correct for this or all, all over you know every time a different kind of wave comes along it's going to be very very difficult yeah, one of the fundamental problems with the the method is that, as we said, it's interferometry and the wavelength that you're working with is tiny. And interferometry means you just see a set of fringes and they're separated by uh, a distance that's proportional to that wavelength. And so um, if you vibrate the platform, like you're running an engine on a ship or a tank or a plane or anything yeah. Yeah. that's you know running an engine and there's this vibration this constant vibrating noise on the platform you're on that will just completely blur and wash out the very interference fringes you're trying to measure so they've got serious issues with the simple practicality of all of the things they're going to mount this to are going to vibrate yeah. and have um like mechanical noise associated with it, as well as big things like rolling waves on a ship yeah. So that's those practicality issues that make it very hard. But as I alluded to earlier, the sort of theory is that if you've got, if you're using atoms, there's no biases on the system and they're all identical and that removes the bias problem um, that can come about calibration, basically. It should be much easier to calibrate and stuff like this. But in reality, in inertial navigation, um, while biases and noise are the main source of drift for something really cheap like the sensors in the smartphone. Um, if you just had a noiseless, biasless sensor, you wouldn't actually have amazingly good inertial navigation for huge long distances and great times, uh, like you know, trying to navigate for a month without any other aiding, because other um, sources of error then dominate. Okay, and they are very important sources of error. So the navigation. So, it's, so it's no good just driving down one source of error when there are other ones potentially to overcome it's it's kind of yeah you run yeah. into diminishing returns there's there's a bit of i don't want to use the word hype um th there's a bit of over eagerness that's come through all of this which is basically hey look if i if i get rid of the bias and I get rid of the noise then i'll get like incredible inertial navigation performance but that's because they some people don't realize all of the other error sources that they don't know about yet because they're not experts in inertial navigation, they're quantum physicists. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I'll, I'll rattle off a little list for you. Um, <laughs> on. The inertial navigation uh, maths involves linearizations and approximations and 
um, a whole bunch of things like numbers being stored to a finite precision. You know, pi is obviously not stored to its true value inside any computer. You know, and the fact that you truncate all of these numbers and actually not all numbers are representable in a computer. That's a whole complicated story we're not going to get into. But believe it or not, uh, not all numbers are correctly representable inside a computer. There's a, a effectively a rounding error for lots and lots of numbers to do with how binary works when you're trying to um, when you're trying to um, record numbers below zero. Um, so uh, there are all of these is issues of numerical precision and numerical accuracy. And the thing about inertial navigation is that you're forever adding your yeah. current values to your last values. Yeah, yeah. It's accumulating. It's a cumulative yeah. thing. That's so you accumulate good. all the errors. So all the rounding errors you've ever had are just growing and growing and growing in your inertial navigation computation. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to do with simply the, the maths and the mechanics of how inertial navigation works. But one of the biggest issues is that these um, accelerometers, um, there is no way to tell the difference between a measurement of 9.81 being because the sensor is stationary yeah. on a table on Earth yeah. versus it's measuring 9.81 because it's out in deep space and it's being accelerated yeah. by an engine and accelerating through space at 9.81 yeah. per second squared. And um, that uh, inability to distinguish between gravitational ac acceleration and the inertial acceleration that moves you through uh, space means that on Earth, when you have this sensor stationary in a lab and you're measuring a number around 9.81, an inertial navigation system has to say, well, I, I need to remove the effect of gravity and then whatever acceleration is left I will add yeah. and I will assume that that means I'm moving. And so um, the problem is gravity is not 9.8 blah. Yeah. It's more, there's more gravity at the equator than the poles. And yes, thank you very much. We we live on a lumpy earth. Let's be brutally honest. And, um, you know, if you stand next to base camp of Himalayas, believe it or not, you know, gravity, the gravity vector is pointing a little bit into that big mountain yeah. you're next to. So it's not straight up everywhere, and it's not the same number everywhere. But these um, inertial navigation systems have to estimate yeah. what gravity is where they are, minus that out of the um, measurement, and then accumulate whatever's left. So you need a very um, good map of, of G, need, basically, across the Earth as well, or anything else that could affect the inertial exactly. system. Yeah, you need... Um, uh, you you would need an incredibly high resolution gravity gradiometer map that's telling you um, exactly what vector gravity is actually acting at where you are, and then um, the, the the strength as well. But unfortunately, this is also a really nasty um, uh, feedback loop, right? So if you incorrectly estimate your position a little bit, you therefore incorrectly estimate gravity. Mm -hmm. You remove slightly the wrong number. You're left with an extra acceleration that you shouldn't be really putting into the system but you integrate it into the system and that pushes you even further away yeah. from the true location and the problem gets worse and um everyone talks about inertial drift because of biases and noise but actually with a biasless and noiseless sensor the inertial drift growth is still going to be serious compared to the mm -hmm. performance that everyone's hoping will get out of cold atom because we just don't know the true value of gravity everywhere. So you'd have to, in theory, survey this um, very, very well. And that's one of the approaches that people are thinking about using. Um, and then the, uh, I, I'm not going to spend all night on this. There's a big <laughs> list. I'll give you one more. Give us one, give us one more, the top, the top more. three there. Rule of three. So, um, the platforms are quite big at the moment, and you're literally lobbing a cloud of atoms up a tube and catching it at the bottom and making a measurement on it. Mm. Um, so it's the time taken for this cloud of cold atoms to do a journey in the tube. Mm. And it takes about a second for them to um, uh, cool it, cool everything, launch it, catch it, do the measurement. So they're, they're making a measurement every second, just about roughly at the moment. Inertial navigation systems that we use at the moment uh, make measurements about a thousand times faster than that. 
And you need to be making your measurements of acceleration and rotation yeah. at a much higher rate than you are actually, you know, moving through. Yeah, space. the resolution. Because if you're buffeted by a wave coming this way and then one coming this way and they're coming every half a second or something, you're you're going to get aliasing and, and, and a big mess of what's yeah. going on. So if I use my phone as an example, if I, if I had the, the inertial sensors in this phone are running at 400 hertz, I think 400 measurements per second. So if I just do this with my phone, then you could beautifully and accurately reconstruct yeah. all of that wobble by effectively knowing 400 points along its journey, yeah. basically. Cold atom interferometer, um, there's my first measurement and then there's my next measurement. Um, I cannot possibly reconstruct yeah. that entire beautiful trajectory with one number I measured here and one number I measured here yeah. and zero information yeah. in between. Yeah. And so you can't actually reconstruct the trajectories. This is called the dynamic range. The dynamic range of the sensor needs to exceed the dynamic range of the platform. And one hertz is knit. These sensors <laughs> are going to have to run at like many hundreds, if not thousands of hertz. And so we talk about trying to combine these cold atom sensors with normal stuff that's running much faster yeah. and try to kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah. That's just degrading fundamentally. You can't really add a very high quality, low rate sensor onto a rubbish high rate sensor and pretend that you're going to only maintain the performance of the incredibly high rate sensor. Mm. It's not how maths works. Um, so uh, that is one of the biggest problems because it's going to be very, very, very hard to increase the dynamic range of these things. Again, because of simply because of the physical mechanism that they employ, mm. the methods they use mm. to make these measurements. If you make the system really tiny and you throw your ball of atoms over a few millimeters instead of over a meter, then the measurement will be a thousand times worse. And you, you're destroying the whole reason you're doing this. In the you person. won't get you won't get as much drift to be able to see the shift in the interference, I'm guessing, if you, if you, the if you do that situation. The sensitivity of an interferometer mm. scales yeah. with size. Which is why your gravitational wave interferometers are kilometers long right exactly yeah i won't go on the list continues <laughs> well i guess i guess the other the other big one is just practicality right so when we look at this thing it's on the ship and it's a it's a big horrible box at the moment I'm sure like you said you could scale this down but there's limits to that given the physical um yeah. methodology that you're using and this which might look not look too big like the size of a big sort of commercial fridge but if you've got a submarine, this is a this is a big ass box that you need to get in there somewhere. Yeah, so, so I believe I think that is actually a shipping container that's their lab. Okay. And inside of that shipping container is the cold atom interferometer. Right. It's, okay. It's so it's not quite as big as that, but it is. No, but still it's quite the big. size of a chest fridge. Okay. So it's big. It, it's it's yeah, big enough for a human to get inside. Which is which is the, the inertial measurement units in this are smaller than my fingernail. So there's a big difference. Much smaller, in fact. They're probably like grain of sand size nowadays. And on a submarine, all that space and and mass is going to have to be taken into taken into account. So, bringing all that together, what do you think is the likelihood that we're going to be seeing these these systems out in the wild in the uh, in the foreseeable future? Or is this just like you said? It's not. We we, we don't want to. You know, this is amazing work, but maybe it's not just not viable in the in the practical situation or maybe a lot of work still needs to be done so how likely yeah. do you think we are to be seeing this anytime soon so these particular sensors i think have a much uh, higher likelihood of being used for surveying than for navigation okay. so basically making those gravity maps that we were just referring to um so put put them on a platform like a satellite or um something that doesn't have very very complicated dynamics um, make these sensitive measurements and uh, actually go the other way and measure all yeah. of the values of G everywhere um, because there's um, there's certainly still a demand for finding every scrap of oil, you know, all the gold, all the lithium, <laughs> etc. And, and actually surveying the earth for density um, variations and things is going to be useful. So I think they'll be used more for that. Um, you could still use them for submarine navigation, I'm sure, um, because at least that that can be an incredibly low dynamic platform. <clears throat> so submarines basically, at some stages of their operation, are basically walking, um, you know, very deep. 
Um, so they're not moving very fast at all. And they are, because the faster you go, the more noise you make. Um, so they travel very slowly and very deep. And very slowly and 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 uh, no rocking motion from the waves at the top is a, a good fit for the problems that these things have. So I could see them still being being used pretty much just in that domain. But the most... You accurate... probably can't see them being used on a fast-moving ship on the waves, bouncing up and down. I, I think it's an unnecessary problem to solve for... For something above the surface, you're going to use GPS anyway, right? So Yeah, there's... Well, although you have the jamming other comes in again do. there, so... Yeah, yeah, but there's lots of... Above surface, there's lots of options. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that we already have lots of other ways to um, uh, solve the problem. Um, it's certainly more... Uh, that submarines are incredibly important platform mm. that are not allowed to make any noise or emit any radiation um, in order to stay incredibly st stealthy. So it's much harder for them than for other platforms to navigate without GPS. And, and I did notice in the articles that there's very little information given about the success or otherwise of these tests, apart from, you know, it was successful to some extent, which... You've always told me when we've discussed this that anything to do with with submarine platforms is very much hush hush. We we did a test, but you, you know that's what you're getting. You're not getting anything else about this. We're not even saying it's on a submarine. So, but yeah. potentially some of the secrecy and the the use cases suggest that this might be an underwater platform that's been considered. I mean, it's um, it's quite clearly the the. Uh, most important application of something like this but yes they i can i can certainly believe that the navy was saying no comment whenever anyone was saying the word submarine because uh, <laughs> just by definition you don't talk about them when you're you know operating them. but um uh sorry you made me think of something um what did you actually ask me there uh, i was just saying it, it, it basically it seems like that their, their reticence in these articles suggests that this will be, the use case will be on some Yeah, rooms. sorry, and I remember what I was going to say. So they, they basically said in the news today um, that sort of they can't say what they were doing and what they were testing, they're happy with it or something like this. The very first test they'll have done is check the um, number of measurements they could make that were useful. Yeah, They won't have actually tried to do anything to do with navigation or combining the accelerations over time to measure any changes in position. They'll have literally, I believe, in this first trial, just generated the availability metric. So how many times did they try to make a measurement but couldn't because of the rolling ship, the noise of the vibration, et cetera, et cetera? So I, I bet they've just... Just getting some it. idea of the logistics of, is this yeah. a, something we could use at all? Yeah, how, how available is the measurement going to be? Um, and just in the closing thought on the, the submarine nav stuff what we do know is in the public domain in some patents and some other clever stories and in fact was sort of in um uh the hunt for red october um uh the gravitational gradiometry mapping uh, has been demonstrated in the past as being a very accurate way of navigating great long distances without any um gps fixes and you don't need cold atom sensing to do it. So you can do it with existing traditional methods of measuring um, accelerations and gravity gradients. And basically, you do kind of what we were discussing earlier. You you survey a map of the region you're going to operate in of gravity gradients, and you use accelerometers on turntables to measure the gravity gradient where you are. So literally, which vector you currently got, and um, it was demonstrated by the US Navy decades ago that you can actually map match um, your gravity vector kind of bobbling around like this as you move along to a map of gravity gradients. And right. you're basically sensing all the lumps and bumps of the undersea mountains and things that you're wow. traveling past. And um, the sort of the really interesting bit of this story is that in the Hunt for Red October, the book, not the film, um, this is described in great detail in an impractical way. In the book, there's, uh, I believe it's like two huge lead balls at both ends of the submarine with a laser beam bouncing between them or something like this, something massively impractical. And the entire submarine is, is the gradiometer. But Tom Clancy wrote all of this stuff. And um, 
he was arrested because uh, got too uh, close the, to something. Well, at the time, this was a top secret research program doing exactly this stuff, and then it appears in Tom Clancy's book. <laughs> but they took him in for a chat um, and tried to determine if someone had leaked to him mm. this stuff. Um, but uh, he convinced them that he'd sort of come up with the concept separately. And, you know, as I said, as it was described in the book, it's totally bonkers mm. in, in terms of the actual mechanism. Um, and then a few years later, um, it was declassified. And uh, the story I was always told was that the only reason they declassified it was because it was in Tom Clancy's <laughs> book. But in the book, it was a Russian technology. Mm. So the Americans declassified it, going like, "No, nope, we did it." Did you um? Did you do the back of the envelope calculation to say like, so if they're going to do this incredibly, um, incredibly high resolution map of the of G basically across the the surface, how what's the what's going to be the change if somebody comes and sits right down next to the sensor? Yeah, so compared um, to that based on the distance you are away from these lumps and bumps under the sea. It's certainly the case that sensors of this sort of sensitivity, um, uh, if you if you set them up in your navigation room and sort of uh, set them going, uh, and then a 100 kilogram person comes and sits right next to it and stays there then for the rest of the journey, that bias of having this unexpected mass turn up right next to the sensor of the whole journey would start to have an effect. So, uh, I mean, the, the idea that you could navigate purely inertially with no map matching or no mm. uh, uh, help from GPS over extended periods of time uh, is just not plausible because this is a form of a bias. And even though the cold atoms themselves um, are supposed to be biased less, the fact is that the vessel is going to change its own um, kind of um, mass layout over time and that alone will start to also um, add yet more errors to these sorts of techniques so pure inertial navigation is not something that you can really seriously do for um you know months on end uh without getting serious drift even if you've got perfect sensors interesting so so the only thing i've got i've got left to quickly run through what what do you think are the next steps for getting any sort of system using this this procedure up and running? What what are they going to do next with this? You said maybe the navigation won't be the final use case, but what what do you think they're going to where do you think they're going to go next with this over the over the coming months? So um this was a single axis accelerometer. And so if there's any hope at all of doing any sort of navigation demonstration, they're going to have to do uh, three axes of um acceleration and three of rotation as well mm. and so that whatever the equipment actually looked like inside that shipping container it's going to get a lot so like when we did physics in cambridge we're going to start with 1d now the 2d's <laughs> come along and now 3d's come along so you got what yeah. you got to work up to the uh the real life situation yeah so that's going to be very very hard uh people have demonstrated multi-axis versions but they're very big bulky and challenging and um, one of the biggest problems that I forgot to mention earlier, this is my fourth of my top three, All right. uh, the nature of how this cold atom interferometry stuff works, it can both measure rotations and accelerations, um, which itself is a problem. Normally you design your gyros so that they're as insensitive as possible to accelerations. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to accidentally measure any acceleration as being a rotation when it wasn't. And vice versa, you try and build accelerometers that are really insensitive mm -hmm. to rotation. Um, but these things kind of inherently um, are sensitive to both. But they're really, really sensitive to magnetic fields and changes in the magnet. Um, and holding up a little magnet next to the, the cloud of cold atoms just makes it slam into the magnet. Um, so and I guess there's tiny changes over the over the Earth's surface as well, maybe. Um, well, that, that this is the problem. Again, this is well. the problem. Yeah, moving through the Earth's magnetic field is going to keep perturbing mm. the accelerometer measurements of a cold atom accelerometer. So um, they'll need very, very good magnetic shielding. Um, so I, I think, unfortunately, there's they some people working in this field probably didn't realize just 
how big a difference it is from going from a static experiment in a lab to an actual yeah. navigate experiment through changing magnetic fields, changing gravitational fields, lots of platform noise, um, and so on. So yeah, it's a huge step out of the lab, this one. Very, very interesting. Ramsey, thank you very much for, for going through that with me because it's uh it's big in the news today. So have a have a listen to this. Go have a look at the articles. I'll put them down in the description below. Ramsey, do you want to point anyone anywhere to find out more about this? Because it seems to be one of those things that keeps popping up every now and again, doesn't it? The best article I've read on this today is my friend Tom Whipples, who writes for The Times. And I'm not just saying that because I'm quoting. Is that him. because you yeah, because you've got a couple of uh because you've got a couple of lines towards the bottom. So uh yeah. That might be uh that might be <laughs> that might be something to do with it. <laughs> but I'll I'll link that and uh and other uh and other uh, outlets articles about this down below. Yes, it has been a it has been a popular article. I think I think one of the uh one of the outlets broke the uh, embargo, didn't they? So one sort of popped out on Monday, but most of them have come out today. So this is this is hot off the press stuff. Yeah, I, I think it's been across radio and TV today. Um, so I don't know if there's any extra bits and pieces that we don't um, know about for this uh, right now. But uh, yeah, there might be some more stuff that appears over the weekend and on Monday as well. If there is, I will make sure that that's put into the... Um, into the description below so you can go and check all of that out uh go and check out uh ramsey's twitter which is always uh entertaining i'll uh i'll link to that and his web pages and his uh and his uh background articles ramsey thank you very much again i think you have to run off and do your uh family yeah. duties now don't you so I'm, I'm fine. exactly yeah, yeah. i will uh i will let you go and uh let's talk again soon buddy cheers bye for now sam take it easy buddy I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.